Uh, we're going to actually get started because we've just passed 630. Oh, just for those of us who have parking passes, do we have to do your stick in the slot? In the slot, please. All right, so yeah, so go ahead and grab a seat. All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Vancouver Aquarium, uh, our public program tonight, uh, Sea Monsters, uh, Science Fiction or Science Fact. Uh, my name is Jonathan Holquist. I'm the manager of public programs. Uh, the mission of the Vancouver Aquarium is to conserve aquatic life. You may be asking yourself, then why are we talking about sea monsters tonight? Well, uh, we thought we'd do something a little bit different tonight. We are... Uh, hosting an exhibition here at the aquarium over the next several months called Sea Monsters Revealed, where you can actually come and look inside the bodies of some really interesting sea creatures between now and September. You can come to the aquarium during the day to do that. Those of us that are here at the aquarium tonight will be able to do that right after our presentation. Um, so we can learn a little bit about what's inside the animals. But uh, we did the presentation, we're doing this presentation, this topic, because uh, sea monsters are fascinating, and uh, some of us, from when we were children, were always fascinated with sea creatures, and uh, it turns out that a lot of the animals that scientists study and that we study here at the aquarium were mistaken for sea monsters in the past, and there are actually scientific explanations uh, that describe the actual, the real animals that people saw. Uh, and that were or were not sea monsters, that were considered sea monsters in the past. Um, our speaker tonight uh, is a technical writer. Uh, he has spent his life basically studying uh, sea monsters. He's a very passionate uh, and uh, an inspiring person. Uh, he he uh, went to BCIT here at, uh, in British Columbia and uh, He's going to be talking to you about, uh, of course, sea monsters and his passion. And um, if you have any questions, you can uh, wait and, and answer, ask those questions at the end of our presentation. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to our speaker, uh, Adam McGurr, the Vice President of the BC Cryptozoology Club. Welcome. Thank you, Jonathan, for that excellent introduction. And thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, thanks to the Aquarium for putting on this excellent exhibit. It's uh, really great. Can't wait to check it out with you later. Sea monsters. Fact or fiction? I'm Adam McGurr. I'm Vice President of the BC SEC. As Jonathan mentioned, this is a subject that I've been interested in pretty much since I could read. I was interested in things like sea monsters. And one question really stuck out for me. Do sea monsters really exist? We all know in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous period, there were huge marine dinosaurs swimming around, feasting on small fish and squid. We know that there are tales from ancient times of sailors encountering giant octopus-like creatures that they knew as the Kraken, but in this, modern world, in this day and age, do sea monsters really exist? I'm a member of the BCSCC, which stands for the British Columbia Scientific <laughs> Cryptozoology Club. I emphasize the scientific because when we hear reports of things like sea monsters, our role at the BCSCC is to determine is there a biological explanation, a known animal that could fill the role of the sea monster? So we are made up of people like journalists, photographers, even scientists. And when people have a sighting of a sea monster, they call us. We like to think of it as a form of citizen science. If you have a sighting of a whale or a dolphin, you can call the aquarium here, the Cetacean Sightings Network. If you have a sighting of a, of a rare shark, you can call the Department of Fisheries. They have a hotline for that. If you have a sighting that doesn't fit either of those two categories, you can call us. We'll be happy to take your call and ask you a few questions about what you've seen. There have been hundreds and hundreds of sea monster sightings over the years. There are only a few that really rise to the top. 
a lot of people ask me, you know, is this your full-time job? Jonathan mentioned I'm a technical writer by trade. There's a big difference between sea monsters and wealthy cryptozoologists. <laughs> the difference is that sea monsters might actually exist. <laughs> okay? The people who are interested in this sort of thing, don't, they don't do it to get rich. They're interested out of an insatiable curiosity about the natural world. And that's why I'm here tonight. A lot of the time when we get a report of a sea monster, one of the first things we wonder is, it, could it be something like this? This is an elephant seal. They can be several hundred pounds. They can be quite irate, as this one appears to be. Now, elephant seals are not common in the waters of British Columbia, but I actually participated in a, uh, a course here at the aquarium. It was the Intro to Marine Life course. It was excellent. And I learned that elephant seals can sometimes migrate into our waters. So if you can imagine three or four of these massive marine mammals swimming together in a line, you can see how that might trick some people into thinking of sea monsters. Here's another <laughs> usual suspect. Right? This moose, uh, it's got this kind of horse-like, camel-like head, which is a very common attribute that people describe when they have sea monster sightings. It's even got a little bit of a hump on its back. Anybody who's seen a moose in real life knows that they can be thousands of pounds. They can be very significant creatures. And moose and deer have actually been sighted swimming out in the open ocean. Perhaps they, you know, they try to cross over from the Sunshine Coast to some of the smaller islands in the, the Georgia Strait. Maybe they get swept away by a very strong ocean current. But fishermen have seen deer swimming way out in the ocean where they don't seem to belong. And so that might also be a source for confusion. But do all sightings of sea monsters necessarily fall? Can they be satisfied with one of these creatures? I'm not so sure. I'd like to tell you a story. In the early 1800s, a man named Pierre Denis de Montfort, he painted this illustration here after interviewing sailors who were sailing off the coast of Africa. They described, much like the Norse legends of old, they described a huge octopus-like creature that would attack their ships and wrap its arms around the sails and the mast and drag the boat to destruction. Pierre Denis was actually a trained malacologist. A malacologist is somebody who studies mollusks. So octopus, squid, uh, even things like snails and uh, clams, those are mollusks. Pierre Denis risked his reputation on this painting. He presented the evidence to his peers in the scientific community. And guess what? He was laughed at. They said, Pierre, this is an old wives' tale. This is a, a story that sailors tell after spending way too many nights at sea. Pierre Denis actually went broke. He lost all his money. He, he lost his reputation. He fell out of the scientific community. And he died in about 1820. 1861, the French gunboat Aleton encounters this massive creature in the water. They tried to capture it, to bring it aboard the ship. They didn't succeed in capturing the whole specimen, but they got the top piece of this animal up here. It's part of the mantle. And that's when they determined it's not a giant octopus. It was a giant squid. OK. Now, 1861, that was a long time ago. In more recent years, 2003, there were a couple of sailors participating in the Jules Verne Trophy. This is a race around the world 
by sailboat. Off the coast of Portugal, suddenly they were unable to maneuver their boat. They discovered a giant squid, just like this one, wrapped around the rudder of their ship. They had to stop. They didn't want to engage. They didn't want to hurt the creature. They waited for about three hours and eventually the squid let go. That was 2003. Maybe they're just trying to hitch a ride this whole time. 2004, Japanese scientists capture the first footage of a living giant squid in its natural habitat. Okay, these animals are massive. No one can deny that these monsters exist in the sea. Many specimens now have been collected. They have washed up on the shores, even in Newfoundland, part of our country. Many specimens have washed ashore. There's, in fact, an entire museum now in Newfoundland devoted to the giant squid. You can learn interesting facts about the giant squid, like its eyeball. The eyeball of the giant squid is currently the largest known eyeball in the entire animal kingdom. It's about the size of a grapefruit. A lot of people believe that the size of an eyeball may be indicative of the intelligence of an animal. So interesting. They do live in the dark, in the depths. Having good vision would help them find, find prey. Also, in 2004, scientists discovered that the giant squid is always laughing. <laughs> Does anybody know why the giant squid is always laughing? It's because somebody went down and gave them each 10 tickles. Right? Is that bad? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's not true. The giant squid is not always laughing. We don't know. Another impressive specimen. This is Vampirotuthus infernalis. Its Latin name literally translates to the vampire squid from hell. Okay, this is a real creature. This is a drawing that we have here. There are not a lot of photographs that exist of Vampirotuthis, but this is a, a real creature confirmed by science. Appropriately, Vampirotuthis feasts on the dead. Okay, little bits of fish and other squid that are feasted on by large marine predators, like sharks, trickle down to the depths where Vampirotuthis is waiting to suck up all the scraps into its beak. Got to be one of the best Latin names in the animal kingdom. Going back in history again, Olus Magnus in 1555, he published the Carta Marina. It's a map of the oceans of the world. And on many places on this map, there were depicted sea monsters. Again, these go back to Norse mythology, Greek mythology. This is one of the pictures from the book that he also published, A History of the Northern Peoples. This clearly depicts a, you know, a sea serpent-like creature. Maybe there's some smaller uh, juveniles down there. It's attacking the ship. It's making off with a very unhappy sailor there. Maybe it's eating him. Could this encounter that's depicted here, can you explain that with the giant squid? Maybe, maybe not. 1848, the HMS Daedalus, sailing off the southern tip of South Africa, the Cape of Good Hope. It's 5 p.m. The crew is having dinner. They're all in the mess hall. The captain is alone on the deck. And he cites this massive animal, can only be described as a sea serpent. And he calls the entire crew to come see. You can see in the drawing, they're all witnessing this giant creature. They said it was swimming at about the same pace as their boat. It was larger around than a full-grown man could wrap his his arms around. It had a very serpentine-like appearance. 
And the captain was so awestruck by this creature that he commissioned a set of drawings. And this is one of the drawings. So the drawings were reprinted in many newspapers around the world. It caused a frenzy of interest in the subject of sea serpents. 1860, very shortly after, an oarfish washes up on the beaches of Bermuda. Now, the oarfish shares many attributes with your classic sea serpent sighting. It's got these kind of continuous fin running all the way down its back. It's even got a little bit of a fringe on the back of its head, very common attribute in sea serpent sightings. This is the longest bony fish that we know of that exists on the planet, the oarfish. Here's a better picture. Its Latin name is Regalicus glesni. Regalicus glesni means the king of herrings. It's actually a type of herring. Uh, some people believe that it was given the name king of herrings because of its immense size. Other people believe that the king part comes from this crown of appendages that it has on its head over here. That kind of fringe, that mane, is another very common attribute in sea serpent, sea monster sightings. So Regalicus, again, this is a drawing. This is a creature that is known to science. They've washed up. They can grow 30, 40 feet in length. They can be several hundred pounds. Are all sea monster sightings attributable to an oarfish? I don't think so. Who's heard of the Loch Ness Monster? <laughs> Everyone, right? This is the world's most famous monster, without a doubt. In the 1930s, a new highway was built in Scotland along the side of Loch Ness. Now, Loch Ness is actually one of the United Kingdom's largest lakes. People began seeing strange things in the water, dark humps, long necks. There was a famous picture that looks a lot like this illustration that was taken. It's a black and white photo. It was taken in 1933. It's known as the, the surgeon's photograph, and it seems to depict a swimming dinosaur in Loch Ness. Now, that photo has been revealed as a hoax. Okay, The surgeon he was a neurosurgeon who created the photograph. On his deathbed, he admitted to hoaxing the photo. They took a small, a child submarine. They built this kind of dinosaur looking thing on top of it. And they took the photo from a significant distance so you couldn't really tell the size. But they had everybody fooled. And this image of a sea monster or a lake monster has stuck with people this whole time. Even though it was revealed as a hoax, it stuck with people. And as cool as it would be to have living dinosaurs swimming around in the lakes and the oceans of the world, I have to say it's highly unlikely. Okay, We all know dinosaurs, they existed millions and millions of years ago. The Earth has undergone climatic changes, there's been ice ages happening. They would have to have enough food in the lake to sustain them. There would also have to be a small breeding population of these dinosaurs to have survived that long. Reptiles breathe air, so presumably we would see them even more often at the surface. Uh, plesiosaurs, the one that this one is modeled after, were actually known to get out on land occasionally, so we might witness that behavior. And we've learned a lot about dinosaurs since the 1930s through fossil discoveries. Scientists will tell you that it is unlikely that a plesiosaur would swim in this fashion with its neck upright and out of the water. The massive weight of its neck and body would mean that the rest of its body would be under the water, much more likely to swim like this. This is Elasmosaurus. You can see very similar, long-necked dinosaur, big fins, move very quickly through the water. Elasmosaurus fossils have actually been discovered on Vancouver Island. 
There's an excellent museum in Courtney, near the Comox Valley. They have an almost intact Elasmosaurus skeleton. I highly recommend checking it out. So, this is kind of our modern image of a sea monster. But if there were these things, if they had enough of a population to still survive to this day, I think by now we would have had a better intact skeleton, not fossil remains, but a fresh skeleton to examine, or at least a bone or a piece of one. So I don't think this is the answer to the sea monster mystery. This is much more likely. <laughs> Excellent web comic by the name of Man vs. Manatee. It was actually created to bring awareness to the situation of manatees and how they're threatened by things like uh, boat traffic and pollution and that kind of thing. Um, you can imagine, like I mentioned earlier, a few seals or sea lions or manatees or walruses uh, swimming in formation. Maybe they're not quite clever enough to know when the, the tourists are around, um, but it definitely could happen and there could be a lot of sea serpent reports that come in that uh, are really just a series like this. Loch Ness is open to the ocean through the river Ness. Uh, there's a lot of trout in Loch Ness, so it's, it's very possible that seals could swim in and be present in the loch. Much closer to home. I took this picture in Cadborough Bay, which is a very pretty seaside community just outside Victoria on Vancouver Island. Great spot to have a picnic. Um, if you stop there, you can see this guy. This is Cadborosaurus, or Caddy for short. He has been a, almost a mascot of the community for decades and decades. And it's because in the 1930s in Cabral Bay, there were a number of sightings of a large unknown creature. The Victoria Times colonist at the time had a regular feature article about Cabrosaurus sightings. And it wasn't just Cabral Bay, it was Oak Bay, even as far as Tofino, um, you clue it, that area, people were seeing a large, long-necked object swimming in the water, clearly an animal, they didn't know what it was. In 1937, this happens. This is known as the Naden Harbor carcass. Now, Naden Harbor is not on Vancouver Island, it is in the former Queen Charlotte Islands, it's now known as Haida Gwaii, and in those days there was a whaling station set up in Naden Harbor. So as they did, the flensers, the flensers are, are the men who cut up the whale, prepared it to be sold. They opened up the belly of a very large toothed whale and they found this. Now these are guys who have seen a lot of different things at sea. They spent years at sea. They'd never seen anything like this before. It was so significant to them that they pulled it out and they posed it on these boxes. You can see they even put a drop sheet behind here. This is 1937. It's a lot of uh, foresight for the time. They had no idea what this was. They thought it was significant. The scale is a little bit tricky here. This is not a 40 foot long sea monster. This is probably only about six or seven feet head to tail. And you can see there's a little bit of a fluke happening here in the tail, there might be some evidence of a uh, flipper or a fin here. You've got your kind of vertebra, spinal column, and then a head, kind of like a horse-like, camel-like head. In the 1930s, this was tentatively identified as a fetal baleen whale carcass, tentatively. The Royal BC Museum in Victoria actually got some samples of the, the tissue. They did some analysis. They thought, well, we don't know for sure, but we're going with fetal baleen whale. Since then, a number of scientists, marine biologists, have looked at this picture and said, nah, I don't know. It's still a mystery. And unfortunately, the remains of the carcass have been now lost to time. Some people think um, the biological station in Nanaimo might have some pieces. People have asked the Royal BC Museum if they might still have some pieces that were sent 
for analysis. It would be amazing if somebody discovered this in the archives in the basement somewhere of their museum and we could do, using modern technology, some real analysis. Many people believe this is a small or a juvenile Cadborosaurus skeleton. Ogopogo, right? If you've been to Lake Okanagan, very nice in the summertime, you may have seen this. It's in Kelowna City Park. Again, very typical depiction of the lake monster, sea monster here with the kind of horse-like head and the, the rolling kind of coils behind it. The interior Salish peoples that had lived in the region of Lake Okanagan for hundreds and hundreds of years, they also knew of a creature in Lake Okanagan, but they did not know it as Ogopogo. They knew it as Naitaka, or demon of the lake. And in those days, it was custom, if you were crossing the lake in a rowboat or a canoe, you would always, always bring a chicken. When you got to the center of the lake, you would drop the chicken as an offering to Naitaka, and the demon of the lake would let you cross safely. Well, one young man didn't believe in the legend of Naitaka. He thought it was an old wives' tale. He had four horses, and he swam them across the lake. It was common in those days. Horses actually don't mind swimming short distances across lakes. He had his, his canoe, he had his four horses, he was holding them by the reins, they were swimming ahead of his boat. He got to the center of the lake and something unseen from the depths below grabbed the horses and pulled them down. He had no choice. He pulled out his knife and he cut the reins to avoid being sucked into the depths with his horses. The horses were never seen from again. But when he got to the other side, he realized that chickens are much cheaper. <laughs> it's the last time he made that mistake. This is an actual picture from Lake Okanagan. This was printed in the Kelowna Daily Courier in 2006. Um, this is not a many humped sea serpent looking animal, but it's very strange. You can see there's a large black hump here. It's moving quickly. It's kicking up quite a disturbance here in the water. The strangest thing about this photograph is this part here. I've asked a few different marine biologists their opinion about this photograph, and they each said it almost looks like a dorsal fin, a fin that has kind of flopped over a little bit, maybe a porpoise, maybe a killer whale. Having any of those animals in Lake Okanagan is almost stranger than Ogopogo. Okay, if there was a pod of something like a large cetacean, like a porpoise or a dolphin in Lake Okanagan, we would see them, we, they would be uh, coming up for air, maybe they're jumping. Uh, we would know by now somebody would have a picture, especially considering all the boat traffic that's on Lake Okanagan in the summertime. So again, this photo, is an unsolved mystery. However, Lake Champlain is near Quebec, sits kind of between Quebec and Vermont in the United States in the east. They also have a lake monster tradition. A number of uh, research expeditions have taken place on Lake Champlain. Uh, recently, they used a hydrophone. It's kind of a microphone that you lower into the water to try and learn a little bit more about what lives in the water they detected echolocation signals in Lake Champlain. So much like a uh, dolphin or a porpoise, other toothed cetaceans use echolocation to find food. Some people have suggested whatever's living in Lake Okanagan might also do that. As far as I know, nobody has done any significant testing. Cameron Lake is on Vancouver Island. Now Vancouver Island actually has at least three different lakes that have a lake monster tradition. You've got Cowichan Lake down south. Sprout Lake is very close to Cameron Lake, actually has ancient petroglyphs that depict a sea wolf, sea creature. And Cameron Lake, um, I actually went 
to Cameron Lake on two separate occasions with a team to do some research, try and figure out in the lake. We were responding to this photograph. This picture was taken in 2009. You can see a very large disturbance on the lake. This lady, uh, we interviewed her. She was driving the highway towards Port Alberni on the way to Tofino. If you ever cross the highway or cross Vancouver Island towards Tofino, you'll, you'll go right past Cameron Lake. She saw a very large disturbance in the water. She parked her car safely, which is tricky to do on that highway. And she took this picture just as the creature was kind of submerging back under the water. Now, we've had this photo analyzed by experts. They estimate it's about six to eight feet in length, this disturbance here. While we were on Cameron Lake with our sonar, with our fish finder, we had several interesting signatures. Under the water, six to eight feet long, one of the deeper parts of the lake. One of the theories about Cameron Lake is this guy, white sturgeon. Now, sturgeon are known in Europe for caviar, delicious caviar. Here in British Columbia, white sturgeon uh, grow to very impressive sizes. In the Fraser River, sturgeon are regularly caught weighing 1,000 pounds, they're 10 feet long, they can live up to 150 years old. There's actually an uh, organization called the Fraser River Sturgeon Conservancy, and they will take you out for a day on the river. If you happen to land a sturgeon, they will measure it, tag it, kind of assess its health and its status, and then release it back into the water safely. As far as we know, and I looked up the, the records of Department of Fisheries, there is no official record of white sturgeon in Cameron Lake or Lake Okanagan. But it would be an interesting scientific discovery if somebody were to take an underwater camera or an ROV and demonstrate that there are sturgeon in those lakes. It would really add to our knowledge of those areas. Giant moray eel, this is another usual suspect that people talk about when you're dealing with lake monsters and sea monsters. Now, eels don't grow that large, comparatively speaking. The giant moray eel could reach a length of, say, 10 feet, maybe 11 feet. Um, it, it is known to be occasionally aggressive towards divers, so maybe you could, you know, you could classify this as a kind of sea monster, intimidating teeth there at the top, but I don't think you can, you can use the, the eel, the moray eel, as an explanation for sea serpent sightings. This guy, this is the viper fish, very intimidating. Can you imagine if this thing grew to lengths of 20 or 30 feet, spent time at the surface, it would be very dangerous. But the viper fish lives deep, deep in the ocean, is rarely seen, um, and usually maximum length is going to be one to two feet. So, good. Let's, let's keep them down there. Not fun. Xythactinus, another toothy fish. Fortunately, this guy is extinct, okay, but they were known to grow six to eight feet long, very toothy, like the viper fish. Um, there's a Canadian fossil museum in Morden, Manitoba that has several very intact specimens of Xyphactinus that you can go and check out. Actually, the same museum just added the largest mosasaur skeleton in the world. Mosasaur was known as the T-Rex of the sea, a very large marine dinosaur. Uh, if you're interested in ancient sea monsters like this, I highly recommend the 4D Sea Monsters movie experience in this theater. Has anybody seen it? Yeah? A few people? It's cool, isn't it? Is it cool? Yeah. You can learn a lot more about creatures kind of like this. Megalodon. No discussion of sea monsters would be complete without Megalodon. Now, Megalodon kind of looks like a great white shark. He is a lot like a great white shark, except much, much bigger. And his name, loosely translated, means big teeth. I've got one right here. You're welcome to come check this out a little later. This is actually a replica of a megalodon tooth that was found in the area of Georgia. There have been a couple of dubious documentaries 
lately produced about the Megalodon. Some people believe that they're still swimming around in the oceans, and the evidence that they cite is the fact that teeth like this are still found. What they forget is that this was based on a fossil. It's a fossilized tooth. Nobody, you can tell by kind of the coloration of the tooth and the, the damage that it sustained, whether or not it's a fossil or a fresh tooth. Fortunately, I can, I can definitely say no fresh megalodon teeth have been found recently. Very impressive. Also, on the list of big sharks, impressive sharks, Ceterinus maximus is also known as the basking shark. And its Latin name, I'm going to break it down a little bit for you, Ceto comes from the Greek keto, which literally meant marine monster. Okay? The rhinus part, does anybody want to take a shot at what rhinus might mean? Rhi nose, rhino. And maximus, pretty self explanatory. These sharks can easily grow to be 40 feet long. And these sharks were a common sight off the shores of Vancouver Island not that long ago. In the 1950s and 1960s, basking sharks were so common, they were actually considered a nuisance. Fishermen on Vancouver Island would usually carry shark insurance because these sharks, they spend a lot of time at the surface. That's why they're called basking sharks. They, they're filter feeders, so they don't have a lot of teeth like megalodon. They suck in water and plankton and small fish, and then they push it over their gill rakers. They expel the water. They keep all the tasty bits. So these animals, they get tangled up in the fishermen's nets. They would cost them all kinds of money. It was very common for fishermen to carry a shotgun on board their, their boat. If they saw a basking shark, they would just shoot it on sight. There was actually a special boat, fishing patrol boat, that was equipped with a large knife on the front of the boat, and they would regularly patrol the waters, and if a basking shark was sighted, they would ram the shark and break its back so that it didn't get tangled up in any nets. Needless to say, the basking shark is now critically endangered. Okay. However, there have been a few, just a few sightings of the basking shark in recent years in the area of Vancouver Island, which is good. Maybe it means they're recovering, they're finally coming back. So, if you were on the beach or in the water, especially around Vancouver Island, and you saw a 40-foot creature swimming quickly towards you, I think you would have no choice but to ask yourself, <laughs> do sea monsters really exist? Thank you. Uh, great job. Thank you very much, Adam. Let's go ahead and take some questions from our audience today. We'll start right over here. The question of the sightings of uh, monsters in freshwater lakes um, brings to mind, because so, there are some uh, freshwater cetaceans, mm -hmm. as, as opposed to some of the other ones you cited were clearly uh, saltwater ones. And that, that, to me, is an important question, mm -hmm. whether they are uh, salt sailing or freshwater beings. Thank you. Yeah, so the question was about freshwater cetaceans. Uh, I know in the Amazon, there's a river dolphin that swims up. Uh, Lake Okanagan there showed the fin. I have to wonder, though, you know, if there are freshwater cetaceans, I, I would think that we would see them more often, especially on a lake like Okanagan that is so busy, you know, you can't even get a hotel room in Kelowna in the summertime. It's, that's how busy it is. Uh, yeah, they, they can be. Um, but there would also, the same rule applies, there would have to be enough of a population. Uh, Lake Okanagan was many years ago open to the ocean through the Columbia River, but it's a very long distance for a pod of cetaceans to have traveled 
into the lake. It is an important thing to keep in mind, though. Thank you. Questions? Anybody else? This this is uh, typical, actually. The questions are on opposite sides of yeah. the theater. <laughs> on the, so the next question will be on the other side. But maybe those of you on this side can think of a question before I go back over. Um, I have. Uh, I remember hearing that Loch Ness is extremely deep, and I'm wondering if the other lakes, like Champlain and. Uh, um, well, the others are also really deep, and if that has anything to do with what people might be seeing. Okay. Good. So the question was about the, the rumor that Loch Ness is extremely deep. I've actually heard uh, Cameron Lake on Vancouver Island is bottomless. It's a bottomless lake, which we all know, you know, that's somewhat impossible. Um, but it is a good point. Uh, lake Okanagan has a few caves um, near the uh, Rattlesnake Point. Uh, Cameron Lake is full of caves. The Horn Lake caves are actually right near there. And many people think that Horn Lake and Cameron Lake are connected by an underwater, underground tunnel. There's a lot of limestone in there. They're carved away by water over the years. So I think it's important to keep in mind that a lot of these lakes might have features that we're not seeing at the surface. They might have areas that we can't easily explore. Really, if you're going to do a search for a lake monster, you can't just spend some time on a boat on the surface. You need to be plunging into those depths, doing things like um, comprehensive sonar scans. Some of those projects have been undertaken, especially on Lake Okanagan. Been several deep scans of the lake, but it's very costly. It's difficult to find the resources to do that kind of research, but very good point. Okay, we have a online question. Uh, do you think there are more discoveries to be made for large sea animals? Okay, more discoveries for large sea animals. I certainly think the ocean still has secrets to be revealed. There is a marine census that is done. I think one was just completed in 2012. There were several new species of things like jellyfish, even very small cephalopods. Um, I don't think it's, it's uh, impossible that another species of shark or whale could be identified, something perhaps like a, another species of eel. And certainly, uh, we already know the giant squid is not the largest cephalopod on the planet. We now know of the colossal squid grows even larger, even more impressive. Um, so I definitely think there's potential uh, in the ocean, but I also think it's very important for us not to um, interfere too much into the natural habitat of these animals. Because when we go looking for things, we tend to disturb things a little more than we, than we mean to. So I, I certainly think if the oceans are healthy over the next few decades, then more discoveries will be made. More exciting discoveries will be made. And certainly the taxonomists will be very pleased if we continue to find new animals. Because yeah. they'll, they'll have some things to do. New okay. names. Uh, Next, right over here. So you said that the giant squid's eye is about a grapefruit size. Mm -hmm. How is it comparable to the eye of, let's say, a blue whale? And whether can blue whales even be suspect for sea monsters? Sure. I mean, that's a, that's a great point. The blue whale is the largest animal to have ever lived on the planet. Um, I think... You know, blue whales are sighted not as often. We know a fair bit about them. Um, I think in the olden days, if there was something like a blue whale, people didn't know what they were looking at. It's such a massive, massive creature. They could definitely mistake it um, for something like a sea monster. Um, nowadays, in the modern era, not so much. You don't tend to see them uh, close to shore. Uh, their numbers aren't, aren't as healthy as they once were. Um, in response to the eye question, Though I want to point out the the whale is a you know it's a mammal and it's got a it's got a huge brain and everything but the eyeball is still not quite as large as the the giant squid um, the the colossal squid presumably could get even larger but interesting fact I forgot to mention um, was a guy once swimming in Lake Okanagan he was doing a marathon swim across the lake to raise money for cancer and he said he witnessed two creatures, Ogopogo-like creatures, kind of watching him from the depths 
with a very large eyeball about the size of a grapefruit. Not making this up. His name was Daryl Ellis, and he did the swim in 2000, and he said there were two long serpentine creatures, and the feature that he noticed was this enormous eyeball. So definitely an interesting attribute. Yeah, at the back there. Jonathan? Well, you've mentioned a lot of creatures that I would probably call sea monsters, or fish, and giant squid, and things like that, and you make a very clear distinction that they aren't. If during sort of further ocean censuses we discover something truly amazing, what would, I guess, the, your criteria be for sort of saying that's a, a sea monster discovered or a sea monster found rather than just another kind of sea animal? Mm -hmm. Good, good question. So definitely, I, I certainly think a lot of the sea serpent sightings in the olden days can be attributable to things like giant squid, uh, or fish, some of these other uh, basking sharks, um, especially carcasses, when carcasses wash up on the shore, uh, very long carcass, huge spinal column, people immediately say sea monster, nine times out of 10, you've got a, a basking shark on your hands that's kind of decomposed uh, slowly. Um, there are some interesting bits of footage and interesting photos here and there that you just can't explain with a basking shark. There's no animal known to science that has an extremely long neck and kind of a horse-like head. Uh, some people have theorized that maybe kind of a pinniped, like a, a seal or a sea lion with an extremely long neck. There could be a, a species, seal or sea lion, with an extremely long neck, and if it grew to great distances or swam in packs, then we could kind of say, mm, okay, that kind of meets the criteria. But how cool would it be if we actually discovered a huge swimming amphibious or reptilian creature that was totally new to science, I think it would be a discovery that the entire world would be interested in, and I also think it would renew interest in learning more about the ocean and conserving the ocean for future years to come. And, and I wonder if one of the criteria of being a monster is that science hasn't really described it yet, so mm -hmm. maybe once scientists get their hands on something and describe it, it's not really a monster anymore, but it's, it's considered now part of our, our living collection on our planet. Good. All right, let's take a couple more questions. The uh, um, wolf eel that's very common in the Pacific Northwest here, and uh, you have a few of them here at the aquarium, um, I would imagine people would, could consider them as a sea monster. I'm not sure if they ever come to the surface naturally or have they, have they been seen? <coughs> uh, do you think they've been observed and people have thought of them as a sea monster? Do you want to take that, Adam? Okay, so the question was about the wolf eel, which is actually common in water, right around Stanley Park, I believe. Um, Lighthouse Point, it's common for divers to run into wolf eels. Apparently, they're, they're not beautiful looking creatures. They're kind of ugly, but apparently they're very friendly and divers will interact with them. They're not intimidating. The uh, moray, large moray eel that we had up on the screen earlier is known to be fairly aggressive. It tends to spend a lot of time in, in reefs. Um, the wolf eel is a little bit more friendly, especially towards humans. Um, I can't say for sure whether or not they would be seen at the surface. I know they spend a lot of time in rocks, kind of hiding in, in rocks. Uh, but their overall length, I think, is fairly limited to probably six feet would be on the larger side. So a huge species of eel, to get back to the earlier question, if we found a brand new massive species of eel, I think you would have to look at every single sea monster report over again to see if it matched that description. Uh, you mentioned that there was a lake where like people bring chickens to, to kind of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Have they found out what actually is eating up all those chickens? <laughs> the chickens? The chickens and the horses. So that is Lake Okanagan. I was telling the story. Uh, you always used to bring a chicken to Lake Okanagan if you wanted to cross safely. I don't think that's a rule anymore. Most people, you know, if you're going out on Lake Okanagan, um, you could stop at KFC or something and probably make a delicious uh, picnic. But no, I mean, it's, it's a mystery. And that's, you know, that's an old story that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. That was their tradition. Drop the chicken in the lake, cross safely. We may never know what was eating those, those animals, those offerings, but it seems to me that there, there could be, like Okanagan is large enough to sustain a kind of large predator, and even a few of them 
which would be necessary if we're talking about a monster that has been talked about for hundreds of years and cited for hundreds of years. There can't just be one Ogopogo. There has to be a few of them, and the Daryl Ellis anecdote of the marathon swimmer, he saw two of them. One was much larger than the other one, so they must be able to kind of find each other and, and reproduce. So, unsolved mysteries. All right, we'll take one last question, and then uh, for those of you here at the aquarium, um, we'll have some time to talk with Adam one-on-one -on -one, uh, at the break. So hey, we've got a question right here. The giant squid? So the giant squid is its own species, right? And when was it uh, described? Okay. Uh, I believe the giant squid was originally described way back in the 1800s as a distinct species. I had a picture up there of the Alaton, the French gunboat. They actually collected a portion of the giant squid. So the species was described back then. It was not actually filmed in its natural habitat for 150 years more years. But yes, the, the giant squid, a lot of people confuse the Humboldt squid, which is very common in the, in the Pacific. It is a large squid, but it is not a giant squid. And there, now there's also the colossal squid, which is a distinct species from the giant squid. It has a number of distinct characteristics. Uh, it makes me wonder, the comment about the taxonomists, if they maybe got a little bit too excited. So you've got the jumbo squid, the giant squid, and the colossal squid. What comes next when we discover the next big squid species? Kraken squid? <laughs> Mega squid. Mega squid. I like it. Are they deep livers? Do they live in the, the bottom of the ocean? The giant squid? That's where, that's where sperm whale go down. Yes. Giant squid and colossal squid are known to live extremely deep um, into Ant Antarctica, the area around Antarctica between you know, Africa and Antarctica, uh, South America. Australia, where it's very, very cold, that tends to be their natural habitat. So you're not going to run into a giant squid, say, around the Great Barrier Reef or right off the shore of Vancouver Island. No, but there was a giant squid um, specimen that washed up on Long Beach in Tofino in 2008. So they are here, and it's, it's the type of thing with climate change happening, oceans are kind of changing. If we start to see more of those types of animals turning up, on our shores, then that could be an interesting indicator of what's going on way down deep. All right, I would like to uh, thank our speaker, Adam McGurr from the BC Cryptozoology uh, Club today. How about a round of applause? That was a great presentation, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, so for those of you here at the aquarium, we're going to do a prize uh, giveaway, uh, trivia. So uh, stay in your seats, and we'll do that after our broadcast is over. Uh, thank you so much for plugging some of the Vancouver Aquarium's great programs. Our Cetacean Sightings Network is up here right now. We didn't pay him to do it. Uh, he just did it on his own. Uh, so thank you very much. Not too late. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's... Um, it's great when we see all the different connections between these different programs. Uh, so we have a whole lecture series planned for our Sea Monsters Revealed uh, sea, uh, exhibition here at the Vancouver Aquarium that's here till September. Our next uh, lecture is on April 15th. It's going to be done by Dr. P our very own Dr. Peter Ross, and he'll be talking about the microplastics that we're seeing uh, more of in the ocean uh, and in critters that live in the ocean. So uh, a little bit of a different spin on it, but uh, it is an emerging uh, threat. So if you're interested in learning about that, please join us for that on April 15th. Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, we appreciate you coming in. And uh, for those of you that are here at the aquarium, we will be going to the Sea Monsters Revealed exhibition. Uh, and you can get something, some refreshments out in the, the gallery adjacent. Thank you very much and good night. Thanks. All right. So, uh, so uh, trivia, right? Okay. The broadcast.